Surrey. Slow towards the exit slip at Junction 10 for Wisley, where a lorry has broken down and is blocking one lane. Long delays to West London. The A40 is queuing eastbound with a broken down coach just near the Hangar Lane underpass. The queues are reaching Northolt and heading westbound on the A40. All lanes are open again at the Greenford flyover following an accident, but the delays are still back to White City. And Putney Bridge is closed with planned work until the middle of October now, which is causing delays through Wandsworth and Barnes. Now, the M8 in North Lanarkshire is only has the hard shoulder open westbound because of an accident at Newhouse at Junction 6. The M62 in Cheshire blocked going east at Birchwood at Junction 11 because of, vehicles fire, because of a vehicle fire. A broken down vehicle on the M5 northbound in Worcestershire is causing delays towards Droitwich at 5. And Scott Rail and East Coast services have severe delays Perth to Inverness because of a police investigation. Or tweet me at LBC. Don't forget that you can watch this live on our website at lbc.co.uk. Well, you got your own imaging. It means you're here to stay, Harriet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what an imaging is. Oh, all, your, all the little bit of music oh, there. Right, it's right, individual right, to you. So, well, welcome a again. We've got lots of calls on the board ready to go. So, should we just get straight into them without further ado? Absolutely. Let's go to John, who's in Croydon. John, hi. Hi, John. Hi, how are you? Hi, very Hello. well, thank you. Yes, thanks. Um, I've just got a couple of questions for you. Um, okay, my first question is, now that um, um, Baroness um, Butler Sloss has stepped down, do you still stand by her original appointment? Well, she That's was... my a... first question. Oh, right. Mm. Uh, are you going to ask your yeah. second one as well? Oh, yes, I can ask that now. And... Also, um, do you think Carmilla Bateman Gillis? Now, I pronounce. I, I apologise if I've got the C Camilla Bateman Gillis. That's that's the one. Yep. Yeah. Um, the kids' company. Do you think she's a good suggestion for um, someone to chair this in in inquiry? I guess you can call it. The reason why I ask is because you know she is somebody who's quite renowned in that area, and also um, she's a lot more in touch, I think, with the public, and the public okay. can kind of trust her, I guess. Okay, John, maybe. that's a good question. Harriet? Well, uh, Elizabeth Butler Sloss was appointed by um, the coalition government, by Theresa May, the Home Secretary, I think at the suggestion of the Prime Minister, David Cameron, and she obviously is a very good and well-respected person, um, but clearly... Uh, the fact that she'd been married to the Attorney General created a lack of confidence amongst the victims of child abuse that she would really be... No, the, the Attorney General was her brother. Yeah, what did I say? I think you said that married. Oh, sorry, that she was related <laughs> to. OK, so, so she was related to... And obviously problems emerged and she felt it was best for her to step down. So, you know, I still have a great deal of respect for her, um, but obviously they should have thought this through a bit more before they asked her but, to but take on that But you would have been job. quite happy for her to have continued in the role? I think that basically if she could have won the support of the victims, which is why what I was going to say about Camilla batman Gelich is that at the end of the day, people feel that there's been so many cover-ups and so much not listening to the victims that it's no good having something which doesn't command the confidence of the victims. If people think there's still going to be cover-up, that there's going to be defensiveness on behalf of the establishment, then this will not achieve what this inquiry really needs to achieve. Because what you saw, for example, with the Catholic Church is that they had little bits of inquiry, then little bits more and more information came out. We really, on behalf of the government, on behalf of Parliament, on behalf of all the institutions that are likely to be engaged in this, we've got to have a complete opening up and transparency. And that's why somebody outside of the establishment how who's you, knowledgeable like How do you like define Camilla, the establishment? Are you a member of the establishment? Um, well, you know, in some ways I am and in some ways I'm not. But I think Camilla certainly isn't, whereas Lady Butler's loss certainly is. Um, and I think that even though her heart would have been with the victims, the perception of the victims would have been that she's part of the establishment but that for so many decades didn't listen to them, whereas because, Camilla, because they course, would know, was on their side. I mean, last week, we had you on, on the programme saying that you thought that she was a great appointment. Then we had Simon Danchuk saying that she wasn't. Diana Johnson, your uh, Home Affairs spokeswoman, didn't seem to know one way or the other. So you, you had politicians from the Labour Party trying to take three different positions on well, this. Well, I don't think 
we were taking three different positions. I think I remember saying that she was at a Home Office appointment, that she needed to make sure that the first thing she did was get the confidence of victims and therefore what she needed to do was, like, really make sure that she had wing members in that she appointed people to work with her who had the confidence of victims, that she would have complete openness and transparency about she did how she did her work. Because there was even, by the time I came on uh, your programme, there was concerns being raised. Um, but I think the most important thing is that the, there should be no stain on her character having accepted it, but having to stand down. Well, let's, but ju I think, let's just remind yeah. ourselves what you said the other day. Oh, right. But I think this inquiry is going to be very, very important indeed. And I'm glad Elizabeth Butler Schloss is leading it because I think she's exactly the right person to be really unearthing what's gone on so lessons can be learnt. Um, you said that exactly the right person, but, but I did um, go rowing back say, a little now. No, but I did go on to say that the most important, one of the most important things was that there should be the confidence of the victims. And with various bits of information that have been brought out about the involvement of her brother as Attorney General in terms of the processes at the time um, that obviously had not been... Uh, under the, you know, the the the, the um, civil servants hadn't been aware of it. Um, then, obviously, the confidence of the victims um, was undermined. And the point is that perception is important mm. as well as the actual reality. I mean, I do think that Lady Butler Sloss is a good person who's done a lot of very good work, um, but she wasn't able to command the confidence of the victims. And therefore, I think when the Home Office look again at it, they've got to be acutely aware of getting somebody who is really uh, experienced in the field of child abuse, but is not tied up in any way, shape or form and with any, the kind of establishment. Any suggestions? Well, I think that Camilla... Well, uh, probably any suggestion I make might, you know, not... Well, I don't know, actually. I don't on. think the government's going to be party political about this. But somebody like Camilla, who actually has got a very, very good insight into things from the uh, uh, victim's well, point of view, I think would be well, we, we no had, bad thing. We had thing. a couple of other suggestions. Jeremy Paxman. I mean, you couldn't get more, more establishment than him, I guess. Helena Kennedy was another one that uh, one of our listeners came up with. I think she would be good, yeah. But she's kind of... I mean, she's a member of the House of Law. She's a leading lawyer. You can't get much more establishment than that. Yes, but she's not been a judge. She she acts on behalf of, of mm. people. I don't know. I mean, I, I just want the inquiry to be overarching, to be far-reaching, to have the confidence of victims and really leave no stone unturned and actually to really complete the job of all the lessons that need to be learned. And I'm sure there will be right. many. Well, let's take another call from Ray in Hackney. Hello, Ray. Hello. <coughs> Hello. Hi. Um, can I ask Harriet... Um, would you agree that much of the present publicity about these historical allegations of paedophilia is motivated largely by an attempt to attach it all to the Tories, top Tories, and divert it away from the links that existed between the left and the paedophile information exchange at well, the time? Um, I, I don't actually think that it's a, a party political issue, this. I think that uh, nobody in any political party in their right mind um, would want to be in, involved in, in covering up uh, what had been gone on. So I, I think that um, I, I, don't, I don't see it as... And after all, um, uh, Cyril Smith was, was a Lib Dem and was not a Tory. And the issues about Jimmy Savile uh, were nothing to do with politics at all. Um, I, I think that PI, the paedophile information exchange, as it's called, um, infiltrated a great many organisations, one of which they infiltrated was something called CHE, which is the campaign, or they sought to Im infiltrate, the, the campaign for homosexual equality, because what they did is they argued that somehow it was to do with sexual liberation, which it never was. Uh, so they tried to infiltrate, I think, even the Home Office. Well. Um, they were quite pervasive in what they were, were trying to do. But I don't think, if what you're getting at is, Ray, that somehow the left was more soft on paedophiles and more preparedness to accept their line of argument than than the right, I don't accept that. But of course that. that was the allegation, wasn't it? I mean, from the Daily Mail against you, your husband, Patricia Hewitt, that they were alleging that there was at the NCCL a sort of softness on this and that, that the paedophile information exchange had indeed infiltrated that organisation. 
Yeah, but the Daily Mail accused me of anything that is currently going, including, I'm sure, that if there was a reinvestigation, the disappearance of the Marie Celeste, it doesn't mean there's any justification do, for what they're do, actually do, do saying. Do you think this this inquiry that is going to be set up, and we don't yet know who's going to lead it or be on the panel, um, they presumably need to investigate the links that the paedophile information, information exchange had to the Home Office, and I, I don't know whether the NCCL is sort of categorised as a public body or not, but it, do you think there not, should be investigations into that? It's not a public body, but there already have been... The archives are all on public display, unlike the Home Office that appears to have lost some of these documents and dossiers, do, do you even think, though... Do you think that they, they had infiltrated the Home Office? Well, there's a suggestion that somebody was working at the Home Office and was keeping... Yeah, I think... Probably that's a yes. They, I, I mean, you know, I don't know categorically, but but they were trying to infiltrate every part of the the system, um, and and certainly the the files, the NCCL files, none of which have been destroyed and are on public, uh, are available for public scrutiny. Um, are there and anybody can and should look at them. And in fact, in terms of referring people for investigation to the police, some of the people who, who were involved in Pi at that time then actually subsequently went to prison. But I think that, yes, all the Home Office files, need to, which are currently mm. secret, need to be looked at as well. J just finally on this, and then we're going to move on uh, to another subject, just finally, were you aware at the time that there were these people having conversations with your colleagues in the NCCL? Do you regret not speaking up more about that? Well, before I went to the National Council for Civil Liberties, there'd been a big row where they had put forward something at the annual general meeting to argue that they should have the right to speak. And actually, they were not even allowed to put forward that resolution at the AGM. They were, were banned, more or less, from speaking. So there was a big row about Pi um, before I actually came to work at NCCL, and they were already you know, being sort of denounced and pushed onto the margins. And I never met any of them. I never had anything to do with any of them. See, what the male have tried to do is imply that I was, like, working for them, which is not true, um, as, I've, as I've pointed out. And I've only ever campaigned on behalf of victims of sexual offences. So it is really outrageous for the male to have tried to whip up some idea that I was in favour of, of sexual abuse. Well, lots more to discuss. 0345 973 Harriet Harman, the Deputy Leader of the Labour Party, is here for Call Harriet for the rest of the hour. This is LBC at 70 minutes past seven. This is Adam Moore in the LBC Travel Centre. Delays in South Yorkshire tonight in Sheffield. Gibraltar Street has been shut. There's a police investigation there between Corporation Street and West Bar. In Cheshire, the M62, very slow both ways between Junctions 11 at Birchwood and Junction 12 for the Eccles Interchange. That's after a car caught fire earlier. The M62 was blocked in both directions for around 40 minutes. In Warwickshire, you're queuing on the M69 southbound. The exit slip road at Junction 2 for the M6. Coventry is shut at the moment after an accident. Greenford the A40 Western Avenue westbound very slow going. The queues from the northern roundabout all the way out to the Greenford flyover. That's after an accident earlier. All lanes have now been reopened though. In Surrey the M25 anti-clockwise queuing on the exit slip at junction 10 for the A3. There's a lane shut there for recovery of a broken down car. And the A303 westbound at uh, Windbourne Stoke is queuing after an accident. Keeping you moving. Your next travel update is in 15 minutes. Ian Dale at Drive on LBC. With the RAC Motorists, we salute you this summer. Here's a little teaser to get your teeth into. Every year, over 5 million teeth are lost due to what? It's not a disease or a condition. It's actually sport. So if you're getting physical, get a gum shield. And brush with Colgate Total Toothpaste every day to give you complete protection for a healthy mouth. For more teasers and the chance to win a weekend of indulgence for two, go to lbc.co.uk. If you can't remember the last time you had your boiler serviced, then this summer you should call the British Gas Team. 
our experts will help ensure your boiler is running safely and efficiently with a service from just £49. To take advantage of this special summer offer, visit britishgas.co.uk or call 0800 316 9070 by the 31st of August. British Gas, looking after your world. Terms and conditions apply. When you first set up your company, you probably never considered it one day turning over several million pounds a year. Yet, here you are. And if your business is ready to take that next step to continued growth and even more profit, perhaps you'd benefit from the expertise that Barnes Rove Chartered Accountants have been demonstrating for over a century. For a free strategic planning meeting with a Barnes Rove partner, visit barnesrove.com slash radio. Barnes Rove. Clever accountants for business. A house fire can take away a lifetime of memories in two minutes. About the time it takes to test all your smoke alarms. Fire kills. You can prevent it. Here's an exciting opportunity for minicab drivers. You could work for a company that offers up to 90% cash work and gives you a £300 bonus when you join. For fewer account jobs, more cash jobs and a £300 join-up bonus, talk to Greyhound Cars London today on 020 3388 or apply online at greyhoundcars.co.uk. Greyhound Cars, running all over London, all day, every day. Harriet Harman on LBC. Good evening, you're listening to LBC. This is me, Harriet Harman, and I'm here with Ian Dale. And you can call in on 0345 973 And that's what Henry from Fulham has done. Henry, can, can you tell us what your question is? Uh, hello, Harriet. Um, I would like to know what you're going to do to help the middle classes of England and obviously Britain, um, I really do feel that the, the middle class contribute the most and take out the least. Um, I want to know, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, I am a staunch conservative, um, heart, heart, hand on heart, staunch conservative, but if Labour came up with one policy that would actually genuinely help me out, I would vote for them. Like what? Well, my suggestion would be is um, if I lost my job the government would pay, well, say I've been working for two years, the government would match my wage for three months afterwards, give me some security. Well, I think that that's a very interesting point, actually, Henry, because sometimes people feel that um, they they pay in a lot over a long period of time, working hard, but that when they suddenly need uh, unemployment benefit, if they lose their job, that actually it's nowhere near enough to actually make them feel that it was worth it for them uh, to contribute. And one of the things that we're talking about is making a higher rate uh, the longer you've worked to recognise the contributions you've you've paid in if you lose your job. But but I would say, Henry, one of the things that I would argue that that might we should probably make a really big difference to you is is having a really good health service because you don't want to have to pay for health insurance you don't want to have to pay to go private to get a really really good healthcare system and i think that that's not just for working class people but it's for middle class people as well and the same with with education um you know really good school system that helps people from lower income families and middle income families as well so i think that actually the idea that there are some things that um, help people on low incomes and other that help people on middle incomes. Yes, I think people on middle incomes should contribute more through their taxes, but actually they need those public services like the transport system. Do, do you, though, accept that you won't win an overall majority at the next election unless you can get back the kind of voters who voted for Tony Blair for those three election wins? Uh, and you've lost them at the moment, haven't you? Well, I think that, you know, we, we'll see. We've been getting votes in all parts of the country, in all different areas, with people finding that they're getting fed up with being told the economic recovery has arrived and it doesn't seem to have reached them and people being told there isn't a housing bubble in London when there certainly is. So, you know, I think the most work out there's this group of voters here this group of voters there what can we offer them so that they vote for us it's about what's best for the country as a whole to create a prosperous economy to have a fair society that's what we should be putting forward and obviously we very much hope people will be voting for it henry um, well, can I interrupt you? I mean, I think that I think that was a very sort of uh, Westminster answer, frankly. And I also think that you know society as a whole isn't fair. And I think that we've got to recognise that. I mean, but by, by definition, the people that pay the most are going to are going to um, use it the least. You know, if you earn 
you earn the most money, the chances are you're going to have your kids privately educated, you're going to have private health care, and yet you'll be paying more tax than someone that takes that takes advantage of both of those things, which I haven't got a problem with. But by, by definition, you know, in, in the purest possible form, society is unfair. And I think that what we've got to try and do is balance it out and not come out with sort of Westminster waffle like Harriet just did, frankly. Um, uh... I'm not quite sure what you mean by Westminster Waffle because I think that having a strong health service and having a good transport system, I mean, presumably you do move around London, Henry, even if you are in the middle classes, um, and presumably you need decent roads and you need possibly even public transport from time to time. Do you know what I think he's getting at? I think he's, and I don't want to put words into your mouth, Henry, but I suspect Henry's meaning that Labour no longer speaks to people's aspirations. Tony Blair did do that, but Labour under Gordon Brown and Ed Miliband don't do that. Well, I I would think that we do because we want to sure everybody gets that there's more jobs for people that there's better jobs that people could start their own businesses that things can be really moving forward in this country and that everybody can participate in that i mean i think that you know that is what's said but that's not actually what our our program that we're putting forward is about and as i say i think things like the nhs i i think that most people don't want to have to opt out of the NHS and into private healthcare system. Um, you know, they and they want a well-funded police service that's able to do its job. I mean, that affects everybody. OK. Now, you can, of course, watch us live on the website at lbc.co.uk. If listening isn't enough, you can watch us too. Uh, Harriet, who should we go to okay, next? OK, should we go to Charlotte in Surrey? Charlotte, hi. Hiya. Um, I just wanted to ask Harriet, how she gets taken seriously in a male-dominated industry? Um, Well, I think that... um, Thanks for that question. I think that it's quite important that there's women on equal terms with men in all walks of life, Um, you know, not just in politics, although that's very important indeed. And women... I think it's quite difficult to be taken seriously if you're in a very small minority because then it's an issue that you're a woman. But I think if you've got a a team of women and men working together, I think that's what makes, uh, you know, our politics, which is supposed to be representative, better. What what do you think, Charlotte? Well, I work in the motorcycle industry and I've done that since I left university. So that's seven years now. And I've had situations where I've been in meetings um, and men would prefer to talk to other men in the room who have less knowledge about the subject and less experience just purely because they're a man and maybe because they're older. So being a young woman makes it even harder. What do you do about it? (sighs) There's not a lot you can do. If you shout any louder, you become shrill. So um, I've been told the best advice is to simply stop talking Oh. Um, and wait for people to hear your opinion. Well, Harriet, you must have come across this in, in your time in politics. When you first got into Parliament, it was very, very male-dominated. What there were, I think there were about 17 MPs back then, female MPs out of yes. 650 or whatever yes. it was back then. How, how do, what advice do you give to someone like Charlotte, who's clearly very, very frustrated? Well, I think it's very good to hear that Charlotte is confident in knowing what her experience and expertise is and has, you know, good confidence and self-belief. So I would say make sure that you hang on to that because I think it can be quite corrosive. If people don't take you seriously, sometimes you can end up not taking yourself seriously. So I think that's the the very important thing. And secondly is I don't know whether you ever get any chance to have a say about who else um, is working in your team, but get some other women in as well so that there's a bit more of a balanced team um, of men and women. And the other thing is, is that to try and, well, uh, you know, you good luck to you is all I can say. In the, in the motorcycle in- industry, are you an engineer or what's your background? No, actually, I'm in PR and marketing for, motorcy- for motorcycles. So um, I tend to have to deal with a lot of men on the client side of things. Do, do you think and you so- tend to, um, to quote a phrase, get used as window dressing, Charlotte? Uh, no, I wouldn't go that far. I don't agree with that. I just think that often they will not listen to my point of view, even though I might be giving them better advice than would come from a male in the room. It's simply their comfort level to talk mm. to another man is, is higher than it is to talk to me or to listen to me. 
Um, Harriet, do you think, particularly in politics, women are still used as window dressing? Because, I mean, it was Caroline Flint that made this comment back in, what what was it, 2009, about Gordon Brown's government. You've made some comments about that yourself. There's a a reshuffle going on tonight with the Conservatives. I see Alan Duncan and Andrew Roboth, and they've both now left the government. Um, uh, Is it still a problem for women being seen as just window dressing? Well, I think, you know, when I started out, women weren't even regarded as window dressing. They were just not in the picture at all. And I think that I have talked about the the fact that open opposition to women doing different roles um, has in a way been replaced sometimes with what I call passive resistance, where people say, oh, we're all equal now, but actually it doesn't work in practice. And I think that when we're thinking about, I know there's been some, there's, we're expecting to have some new appointments to women um, in the cabinet, um, which will be a very good thing uh, to happen. But then the test will be not only do they get into those positions, but what do they do to help other women in the country? So that's that's a challenge to those new women in the cabinet. Are they going to just be joining the men and doing it in the men's own terms, or are they going to help women in the country? Like, well, do, do you think that David Cameron is doing this because he's got a sort of, in quotes, woman problem? Are they going to be window dressing? Well, I don't know. You'll have to ask him on the programme and explain why Gloria de Piera, who's our equality shadow minister, was uh, saying that actually it's easier to be a man on the moon than a woman in David Cameron's cabinet, because there's been only three women in David Cameron's cabinet so it's been very I think it's small. four to be fair but sorry yeah, I think it's four to be fair is it four well yeah. then the same number but I think very very small numbers you know if he's woken up to the fact that actually women in the conservative party have got things to say as well as men that is a very good thing but the thing about it is that it's I don't think it should be like with with Mark with Margaret Thatcher she basically didn't do anything to help the cause of women particularly, Apart from except by Prime being Minister. there. Yeah, becoming Prime Minister, that was obviously very important. But she was doing it like, I can beat the men at their own terms, rather than I'm going to change politics to make it recognise and wake up to women's lives as well as men. So that's the challenge for the new Tory women in uh, the Cabinet. Just, we're going to be late for the news in a second, but just very briefly. Um, a friend of mine, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, and I said we were doing this every month, and she said, you know, I felt really let down by Harriet Harman when she didn't stand for the leadership after Gordon when Gordon Brown resigned because I I think she would have won what would that have done for women and I understand why she said that do you because I think you probably would have won well, I, you know, I don't know. And I'm absolutely delighted that we've got Ed Miliband as our leader. And I'm, I'm going to be <laughs> no, 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 working no. That's as his deputy Waffle. to get him to be prime minister. So, But you can't really win, you know. You, um, I well, think actually it, it was, it was quite, I felt it was quite an achievement to me to, to win a hard-fought contest to be deputy leader. And that's the contest I won, not as a stepping stone to be leader well, myself, but to be deputy. Well, Labour, Labour's never had a, a female leader, apart from Margaret Beckett, for a few months. Um, when the time comes for Ed Miliband to fall on his sword, do you think the next leader of the Labour Party should be a woman? Well, I'm not discussing when the time uh, comes for Ed Miliband well, to be It could be, be 10 years' the... time. I, I'm no, not predicting. I'm, sorry, I'm not absolutely going there. We are focused on the current... I mean, obviously... I want to see women able to play their part in all parties at all levels. I think that matters. I don't think it's right for women to be excluded. I think they should be listened to and play a part in important decisions, same as men do. So that's just my general standpoint. And I don't like to see anybody discriminated against. Well, I tried to lead you down a path and you refused to walk with me. I absolutely refuse, yeah. Well, we've got another half an hour. If you'd like to ask Harriet a question, lots of your calls coming in. 0345 6060 973. I think more calls on this one than anyone so far, so the, the hour's becoming increasingly popular. I'm Ian Dale at Drive. You're listening to Call Harriet on LBC. It's LBC News Time at 7.32. Glenn Thompson has the news headlines. Harriet Harman has told LBC she believes the pro-paedophile activist group, the Paedophile Information Exchange, infiltrated the Home Office. The deputy Labour leader has previously been forced to deny a link with Pi when she was an official in the National Council for Civil Liberties. Harriet Harman has spoken to Ian about the group. Do you think that they had infiltrated the Home Office? Well, there's a suggestion that somebody was working at the Home Office and was keeping... Yeah, I think... Probably, That's a yes. they, you know, I don't know categorically, but, but they were trying to infiltrate every part of the, the system. She's also told LBC Baroness Butler-Sloss had to step down from an inquiry into allegations of historical child sex abuse as she didn't have the support of victims. 
Women bishops could be appointed by the end of this year after the Church of England voted overwhelmingly to back the move. The change has been given final approval by the Church's governing body, the General Synod. Veteran Conservative Minister Ken Clark has retired from the government, bringing to an end a front bench career stretching back to 1972. David Jones has been sacked as Welsh Secretary as the Prime Minister begins a reshuffle of his cabinet. Business news, customers are turning up the heat on their energy providers, according to the Ombudsman. It says complaints have reached an all-time high after more than 22,000 were made in the first half of this year. Controversial payday lender Wonga has appointed a new chairman. Andy Haste has promised to make a significant change to the business weeks after it agreed to pay compensation to customers who received letters from fake law firms. And Manchester United have confirmed they've agreed a new multi-million pound sponsorship deal with Adidas. It's worth £750 million to the club and will run for 10 years from next summer. And in the city, the FTSE closed up 55 points at 67.46. LBC Business. With The Times Business. Everything you need to know on the go. Becoming cloudier this evening for London and the South East. Some patchy light rain overnight and lows of 15 degrees. Rain clearing all but the far South East of the UK by dawn, but a few showers in Northern Ireland and Western Scotland. Tomorrow largely dry with warm, sunny spells. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Glenn Tomsett. This is Adam Moore in the LBC Travel Centre. We've got some problems in Cheshire on the M62. There was a vehicle fire earlier between junctions 11 and 12, the Birchwood and Eccles interchange. All lanes are open now, but it was blocked for around half an hour, so there's still quite a few queues there, both directions approaching junction 11. In Shropshire, the N54 westbound, there's a lane shut of cars overturned there between junction 3 at Albrighton and junction 4 for Shifnal and the A464. In Warwickshire, the M6 northbound, the inside lane's blocked after an accident between Junction 1 at Rugby and Junction 2 for Coventry and the M69. In Greenford, the Western Avenue, the A40, very slow westbound at the moment from the northern roundabout all the way out towards the Greenford flyover. That's after an accident from earlier on. In Surrey, the M25 anti-clockwise queuing at the exit slip for the A3 at Junction 10. Broken down car there blocking a lane. And at Winterbourne Stoke, the A303 westbound is slow after an accident. Keeping you moving, your next travel update is in 15 minutes. LBC Travel. With GoToMeeting. Less time on the road, more with your family. A collection of the most beautiful music for guitar. This is the essential sound of summer. Summer Guitar by Craig Ogden. Out now at selected Sainsbury stores. Sitting at a desk for long hours in the wrong type of chair can be very hard on your back. But how do you choose the office chair that's right for you? Back 2 is the answer. We offer a wide range of office chairs, sit-stand desks and professional no-obligation advice. Too busy? No problem. We'll carry out a workstation assessment in your office. Back 2. Open every day in Wigmore Street and online at back2.co.uk. Get back to business with Back 2, the office chair experts. At Wix, we've got everything you need to plan big and pay small with three for two on Dulux Paint. Pay small with 25% off all deck boards and decking lights. Plan big with 25% off when you spend £50 on tiles and up to 35% off flooring. Visit us today and bring your plans to life. It's got our name on it. Wix. Offers end soon. See wix.co.uk for end dates. Paint offer excludes tester pots. Whatever the weather's doing outside, it's a good day to enjoy Talk Talk's hottest half price sale. Our Essentials TV package is just £4.25 a month for six months with £15.95 line rental. It's Britain's best deal compared to BT, Sky and Virgin. And it includes totally unlimited broadband. The Talk Talk hottest half price sale now on. Feeling hot, hot, hot. To join Britain's fastest growing TV service, visit talktalk.co.uk slash hot. Sale ends July 23rd. £5 delivery and contract required. Connection fee may apply. It's not hard to overload an electrical socket. You just attach too many appliances to one extension lead, especially high-powered ones, like heaters and hair dryers. The problem is, it's not so easy to put out the fire. Fire kills. You can prevent it. 
Ian Dale at Drive on LBC. With the RAC Motorists, we salute you this summer. Harriet Harman on LBC. So this is LBC and I'm Harriet Harman here with Ian Dale. It's 7.38 now. We're taking your calls till 8 o'clock. So you can call me on 0345 6060 or you can text 84850. If you'd like to watch us, you can go to lbc.co.uk. And I think we're going to commud at Rickmansworth here if you've got a question you'd like to put. I have, Harriet. Lovely to speak to you. I wanted to ask that in the very short time between now and the general election, what, what do you think Ed Miliband has to do to change his game, to, to try and stand a chance of turning this thing around and, and getting elected? Well, I think that what I can say about Ed Miliband, which which I can see and I know as I've known him for, for many decades, and I hope that you and everybody else will see as well, is that he's a man who's got principles, he's really a decent man, and he's also got guts, because actually you have to be really tough um, on behalf of a country to stand up to a country. You know, it's not good enough just to have the principles and be a decent sort of person. You've got to be able to fight for it. I mean, one of the things that I've been very struck by is that David Cameron has been like looking over his shoulder at his back benches on Europe and instead of really fighting for Britain's interests in Europe he's like uh, caving in all over the place um, and, well, well, and but that, that's deflecting the question this is about Ed Miliband I mean yeah. what's he got to do what, what's he done wrong since he's become leader there must be something you think well we could have done that better well I don't think he's he's done anything wrong I think it is very tough being leader of the opposition when you've just uh, you're leading a party that has just so, so lost the election so in four years he's done nothing wrong I, I mean, think he's uh, done... I mean, if that was the case, you would be 20 points ahead in the opinion polls well, like no, Tony Blair was. No, not necessarily, because basically we've only just been uh, defeated from a previous general election and usually the expectation is that a party will be out for some time and actually we're very much in contention. And one of the reasons why I think we are in contention is because um, Ed Miliband has identified things that really people are concerned about, like the cost of living crisis. I don't know what you think about that, Kamud. But at the end of the day, you know, it's not a celebrity you're electing. You're electing a prime minister who needs to understand the concerns of people and who's got the guts to do something about okay, them. OK, come on, what that. do you think? I, 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 don't, I don't doubt that. I, I think he is very principled. I think he's very decent. Uh, I, and I admire that about him. But unless he can get him true self across, unless he can get his ideas across, then he can be as principled as, his, as he likes, but he's, he's just going to be a quiet voice. And he needs to really get out there and get the message across. And he just doesn't manage to do that very well at all. Well, I suppose we all remember the last leader of the opposition who had a quiet voice who couldn't quite turn up the volume, could he? And, and of course, we've got Charles Clark now. I don't know if you've seen the interview he's done with Mehdi Hassan today in the Huffington Post. Um, he's been very critical of, of Ed Miliband, says that Neil Kinnock was a better leader than Ed Miliband, was he? Well, I think he was a great leader for his time and Ed Miliband is the right leader for this time. So I think that actually I would say to people, what surely what you want in a prime minister is somebody who's got a sense of where they the country needs to go and a sense that they want to include everybody in a more prosperous future. But that, that was future. Charles Clark's problem in that he, he thinks that Ed Miliband hasn't got a narrative. He's coming out with sort of random policies here, there and everywhere now, but they don't hang together to, for people to think, well, yes, that, that's what I think of this particular leader. Tony Blair managed that, but he thinks Ed Miliband hasn't. Well, I think that what he's saying is very important indeed, which is that there is a, a breakdown in the connection between the the economy recovering and everybody's prosperity recovering and that needs to really be sorted out um, and that while some people have survived fine during the recession most people haven't and actually the task is to make sure that as the economy recovers um, and continues to to go into recovery that everybody gets to play a part in that recovery do, do and th i think that's a very profound uh, an important point. Do you think that it's unfortunate that um, Charles Clark has made these comparisons? I mean, do you think there are comparisons between Neil Kinnock and uh, Ed Miliband? Well, I don't. Uh, I, I mean, mean uh, you know, Charles after Clark all, Neil Kinnock lost, he lost two elections, didn't he? Yes, um, but I think that 
that, you know, the circumstances were very, very different then. And, you know, I think that what I'd like Charles Clark to be doing as a Labour person is to be joining us to working hard uh, to win the election because I think it would be much better for a Labour government in this country. So, uh, you know, it's best, I would say, join us in campaigning rather than commentating. I'd well, say that to Charles, I think. More, more reshuffle news. Two two more men going out of the government, David Willits and Nick Hurd. He's, he's leaving as well. So not not a single woman gone yet. So that, that's something, I suppose. Well, that's because there's not very many to go. So <laughs> <laughs> Free hit for you there. Yeah. Uh, let's go to another call. Who, who... OK, should we go to John in Crayford? Hi, John. Oh, hi, Henry. Uh, hi. hi. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask a question about tax havens. Um, what 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 would you do about tax savings? Because um, I've just researched uh, some stats and there's like 21 trillion, which is uh, stored in offshore tax havens by the top 1%. Um, but it doesn't seem to be anything, you know, that, I mean, it seems like the middle and the poor are actually funding the top 1%. Um, but, you know, I mean, that's why we're in the problem that we're in is because there's just so much being stored away in these tax havens. Okay. Well, I think it's, Ex, you know, very, very galling at a time when public services are being squeezed and there's not enough money for public services and people's incomes are being squeezed, people who are paying taxes and uh, are not feeling that they're getting better off despite working, working hard, to have people salting their money away in tax havens. And I think that actually the way to deal with that is to work internationally uh, through Europe, through uh, the all the global world leaders to make sure that everybody uh, does the same thing and everybody makes sure that there are no places for people to salt their money away. But I think there's also the question of our own country making sure that people don't do uh, tax avoidance. And I would really pay tribute here to my colleague Labour MP Margaret Hodge. Uh, you should have her on your programme, Ian. She well, would I'd answer love the to questions have her on. absolutely well, and we, do, we do have her but, on sometimes, but I yeah. mean, are, are you so going to actually make commitments in your manifesto on this? Because wor words are fine. Well, I think that basically we are very focused on tax avoidance because we need to make sure that that but, money comes in. But will it be in the in. manifesto? Um, I'm sure there will be things on the on the, in the manifesto. But I mean, tax, avo about tax avoidance and tax havens are two different things. They are. I mean, they they can be combined. But yes. I mean, are you going to do anything about tax havens? Well, I think we will be committed in our manifesto to working internationally to make sure that people cannot salt their money away and that all countries work together uh, to make sure that doesn't happen. But we've also, as well as working internationally, we've got to look at what is going on in this country and make sure that the HMRC is strong enough, make sure that the system is not so complicated that people are easily able okay. to get round it. Well, the good news is that uh, we've got about three times the level of calls that we've had in the previous programme, so this is fantastic news. This is LBC, it's 7.46. This is Adam Moore at the LBC Travel Centre in Cheshire, the M62. Very slow both ways between junctions 11 and 12. The Birchwood and Eccles exits after a car caught fire earlier. In Shropshire, the westbound M54, the inside lane's blocked by a car which is overturned. That's between junction 3 at Albrighton towards junction 4 for Shiftnell. Warwickshire, the M6 northbound, the exit slip at junction 2 is shut after a serious accident. That's the Coventry and M69 exit. At Hampton Hill Park Road, the A313, that remains closed both ways after an accident. A van and a bicycle involved there. So Park Road, Hampton Hill shut between the High Street and the exit for Uxbridge Road. That's the A312. In Kent at Hartlip, the A2, that's London Road. That's been closed both ways after an accident at Mill Lane. And in Wiltshire at Orr, the A345 blocked both directions by an accident involving two cars. That's at the junction with Rudge Lane, the air ambulance, also on scene there. Keeping you moving, your next travel update is in half an hour. LBC Travel. With GoToMeeting. Drive business meetings from home and forget about rush hour traffic. Ian Dale at Drive on LBC. With the RAC. Making your summer go further. Moving office. It can be one of the most stressful, costly, disruptive experiences of your business life. But not with Morris Interiors who've been designing, fitting out and transforming workplaces for over three decades. To get your free guidebook, attend a free seminar or book a free consultation, go to officerelocation.co.uk. Morris. Workplace. Design. 
experts. Whatever the weather's doing outside, it's a good day to enjoy Talk Talk's hottest half price sale. Our Essentials TV package is just £4.25 a month for six months with £15.95 line rental. It's Britain's best deal compared to BT, Sky and Virgin. And it includes totally unlimited broadband. The Talk Talk hottest half price sale now on. To join Britain's fastest growing TV service, visit talktalk.co.uk slash hot. Sale ends July 23rd. £5 delivery and contract required. Connection fee may apply. Is it possible to sell your property for the asking price or above in seven days? We think so. We're Paramount Properties. Our open days allow vendors to receive multiple offers after one day of viewings. And this year, 95% of our open day properties north of the Thames sold subject to contract within seven days. And if we don't do the same with your property, we'll charge 0% commission. Paramount's seven-day promise. Visit paramountproperties.co.uk slash radio. Conditions apply. A collection of the most beautiful music for guitar. This is the essential sound of summer. Summer Guitar by Craig Ogden. Out now at selected Sainsbury's stores. This used to be my commute. Jumping on the number 24 bus. This is my commute for the next three months. A walk to work with villagers in Tanzania building a clean water supply. I'm an international citizen service volunteer. ICS is government funded and teams up 18 to 25 year olds with volunteers in 26 countries to help fight poverty. You don't need cash or qualifications, just the motivation to make a difference. Change your world. Apply online at volunteericS.org. Coming up at 8 on LBC, Clive Bull. Britain's army of unemployed over 50s have been given a new older workers champion to tackle ageism in the workplace. David Cameron has appointed the older workers czar to help the 3 million people over 50 who are unemployed. Are the talents of older workers being wasted? Leading Britain's conversation, Clive Bull. This evening from 8 on LBC. And before you listen in to Clive Bull, this is Harriet Harman on LBC and I'm here with Ian Dale taking your calls up until 8 o'clock. We've already been talking about tax havens, Ed Miliband, the middle classes, child abuse and now uh, we've got Peter in Liverpool. Are you there? No, we've actually got Jane in Greenwich. OK, Jane in Greenwich. Jane, hi. <laughs> oh, hello. Um, I just wanted to know uh, what Harriet felt um, about... Schools. I, I went on strike. I haven't been a teacher very long, actually. I went on strike last week because I really feel that uh, the government's obsession with targets and data, which was largely started actually by the Labour Party, is kind of very detrimental to children um, and schools. Uh, and I wondered really what she had to say about that. I think that we're going the same way as the NHS has, um, where actually the focus is coming off the care of children as it came off the care of patients and it's all about targets and data and I think that we're going in a really bad place. Why, why, are, so why do you think better. targets are so bad? Because I think that if schools are obsessed by, with targets and data, which increasingly in my experience they are, the children are just getting lost in that and I think that child-centred teaching is becoming rather a dirty word um, and really I think that what's going what's been happening with the NHS, with Stafford General Hospital, where everyone, shock horror, was um, concerned that, um, you know, nurses weren't showing care and kindness. I think that pretty soon that's going to be the way that schools are going. OK, um, th thanks very much, Jane. We'll come back to you in a second. Harriet, do you, do you think that in retrospect you went too far with this targets culture in the NHS and in schools? Well, it, as far as the um, waiting list is, as far as hospitals and the NHS is concerned, I mean, when we took over in 1997, sometimes people would be waiting two years for a hip replacement. And we basically, as the government said, nobody should have to wait that long for an operation. And we did set targets because we, we had to say, this is what we expect of the NHS. We're going to put much more money into the NHS, but this is what we actually expect. And I think that 
awful neglect that there was in Midstaff's hospital. That wasn't to do with us setting targets but because it, actually we had targets in my local hospital and all around the country where you you didn't necessarily have people uh, abusing patients. And I think that that's just an excuse. But I just but do you think the target culture went too far in, in some cases? I mean, wh- wh- when you had people in A&E departments putting uh, patients on a, on a bed in a, in a corridor, that, that sort of ticked a box and they could fill in a form to say that they'd met the target. The patient might not have been treated for four hours, but they'd met their target. Well, that's people behaving unprofessionally and wrongly. I think that people um, should actually do what they're required to do, not simply do box ticking. I mean, that's not what anybody works in the NHS to do, to meet a target. They they join the NHS in order to help patients, but we need to be clear about what patients can actually expect. And I'm just interested to hear from you, Jane. What data do you think, because obviously there does need to be a dialogue between people working in, in those important public services and the government. What what data do you, are you collecting which you think um, shouldn't be collected? Because I think one of the things that parents do want to know is they do want to see what's going on in a school, you know, how, how many... OK, well, let's get the so answer from Jane. We've only got a few minutes left. Jane? Uh, well, yes, absolutely. I agree with it, that, the, you know, there has to be um, a thorough... Uh, reflection of, of how the children are progressing and of course parents and teachers want that because that's why people go into teaching but I think that the data um, culture has become so dominant and you know let's not forget the data can be always manipulated you know figures are manipulated they're not people they're figures what data um, though think, Jane sorry to interrupt what data what give me an example because you're obviously on the front line what ex- well I mean we, we, uh, for a while it was um, the target was 5A to C uh, GCSEs with children. Now Michael Gove's introduced the progress data where we have to have across eight subjects there has to be a certain amount of progress. So teachers are under this increasing pressure to um, be data driven and I do believe it's detrimental to, uh, okay. to the children. I think that it's not child centred. Alright Jane, thank you. Um, I'm going to move on simply because I want to get two more questions in before we get to eight o'clock. Uh, Peter's in Liverpool. Hello Peter. Hi. Um, I believe in equality for women. But I was going to ask Harriet, do you think that women being allowed to become bishops in an inherently sexist and homophobic institution such as the church, both in scripture and history, is a true step forward for gender equality? Well, there's one for you. Well, I think that um, I did hear somebody on the radio uh, this morning saying that God didn't want women to be bishops. And I just think that... (laughs) How would we know? (laughs) Well, how she hasn't said anything about it, has she? Um, I think that really... You know, the idea in this day and age that women can be priests but they can't be bishops, uh, I just think is really anachronistic and outdated. Why has it taken so long for this to come about? Well, because the church is a very long-standing traditional institution. There have been a lot of women in the church fighting to get more equality because they believe that would be good for the church and I've been very much uh, backing them uh, and I think that, that um, I'm glad to see that this vote has happened today. There's going to be women bishops. Perhaps there'll be a woman archbishop one day. Uh, I raised that point earlier. I suspect not in your lifetime or mine but uh, you never you never know. Uh, right, let's go to Sue in Dover. Hello, Sue. Hello. Hello, Harriet. Hello, Sue. Uh, you've stated before that a problem for female MPs is that they are still defined by their marital status. Well, society habitually reinforces this. Could the Labour Party commit to put in their manifesto for all application forms and other documents to list only Mr and Ms so a woman's marital status is kept equal to the man's? Well, I think that that's a very good point. I mean, it is a real... Manifesto commitment? Well, you know, well, we'll we'll take that very seriously. I'll take that a contribution to our manifesto process through quite seriously. I mean, I remember, I'm old enough to remember, there were some organisations like the civil service where you actually had to give up your job once you got married. And, okay. and so I think that actually women and men shouldn't be judged differently on their marital no. status. Well, as a married woman, I have to fight to be called Ms. Everybody wants to okay. call misses. R- right, let, Sue, Sue, thank you. We're going to try and get, squeeze one more question in. Jeff in Forest Hill, if you can be as brief as you can. A uh, question for Harriet, really, is, you know, although um, I believe in equality uh, amongst the uh, genders, um, I, I still believe that some of the institutions, like the golfing institutions, if you like to call that, pull that one out of the bag, um, where there are um, male clubhouses and female clubhouses and 
where now they're talking about mixing. Why shouldn't we have women? Okay, so just in relation to this um, Royal and Ancient Golf Club, they they won't allow women in. Do you think there should there should only there should be mixed uh, golf clubs, or should men be allowed to restrict their membership to men? No, because I think that I don't think they should be allowed to restrict their membership because actually it's usually all male clubs, um, excluding women, and a lot of. Uh, businesses done in clubs like this and why shouldn't women have the opportunity to do it as well? I think if you look at societies where men and women are very segregated, that's very old fashioned. So, so do, do you think that maybe the uh, the Open should only be held at golf clubs where they admit men and women members? Well I think that that would be, you know, for the people who are place the open but i think that it is about time why, that why all of them were integrated surely in an ideal world that would be the case i don't see why that's a difficult thing to agree with well i think it, it definitely is important for all clubs to be open uh, to 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 women as well as men and i don't agree with men only clubs and it's been a process of changing the law to move forward on that well i i was going to ask you what female pejorative term raj you most love but um, I, I haven't got time i'm afraid but uh, harriet thank you very much indeed thank for you. the last hour. Harriet will be back for another edition of Call Harriet very, very soon. I'll be back tomorrow at four. Coming next, it's Clive Bull. Harriet, thank you very much. And Ian, and coming up after the news...